Good morning, everyone. Excellencies, uh, distinguished delegates, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen. I am uh, delighted to welcome you all to the committee's open uh, briefing on the uh, updated technical guide to the implementation of uh, Security Council Resolution 1373 and other uh, relevant uh, resolutions. For those uh, of you uh, active on uh, social media, I would encourage you to use the uh, hashtag technical guide 2020 in your posts about today's meeting. Please note that uh, this meeting is also being uh, webcast live and that the uh, recording will be made available on the committee's uh, website. Before we proceed, I would like to recall that uh, as it is now uh, a practice with uh, virtual meetings, delegates and uh, participants who are uh, not taking uh, the floor should mute their microphone. A participant may also turn off their camera if they uh, wish so. Excellencies, ladies and uh, gentlemen, thank you uh, all for joining us today for the committee's open briefing on the update technical guide to the implementation of Security Council Resolution 1373 and other relevant uh, resolutions. The threat posed by terrorism and by violent extremism that is uh, conducive uh, to uh, terrorism continue to undermine international peace and security. Those threats have uh, only been further exacerbated by the impact of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, which of course has been felt at uh, numerous levels. As recently stressed by CTED in its report on the impact of the pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic will uh, clearly have short-term, medium-term and long-term impact and implication on our global efforts to combat terrorism and violent uh, extremism. The release of the updated the technical guide and indeed today's open briefing could therefore not have uh, come at a better time. Since the previous uh, interaction of the technical guide published uh, in 1917, the Security Council has uh, adopted eight further resolution on the counterterrorism, which cover a broad range of topics, including among others, counter-financing of terrorism, the proper use of uh, biometrics, the incorporation of the gender dimension, and uh, countering the abuse of information and uh, communication technology for terrorist purposes. The updated edition of the uh, technical guide, which is available in the six official uh, UN uh, languages, incorporates all the new elements set forth in those eight resolutions. The technical guide is intended to be a comprehensive and uh, user-friendly tool which presents the key elements of all relevant council resolution in the form of practical questions that are accompanied by examples of international standards and codes, as well as global good practices. The aim is to enable member states to review and reflect upon their progress, strength, and shortfalls in implementing those resolutions and take any necessary action. It will also serve as a reference guide for the conduct of the committee seated business in many of the technical areas. Here, it is important to reiterate that in order to effectively counter terrorism and violent extremism and ad address the conditions conducive to them, we must avoid narrow, short-term approaches. Our approaches must be holistic, and they must provide for hard and soft measures within clear legislative framework with functioning institutions and effective operations. The updated technical guide takes those imperatives into consideration. It provides government officials and uh, practitioners with the information that they require in order to ensure that their counterterrorism policies and action comply with the relevant council resolution while also uh, respecting human rights and fundamental freedoms. During today's open briefing, we shall hear from uh, CTED experts on uh, specific aspects of the updates made to the technical guide and about their implication for the member states' assessments. Their presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. 
I encourage you all to engage actively in our uh, discussion. I thank you. And I now give the floor to Assistant Secretary General Michel Konings, Executive Director of the uh, CITED, to deliver her opening remarks. Madam, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to begin by thanking the Chair, His Excellency Ambassador Kaptani, for convening today's open briefing on the Committee's updated technical guide to the implementation of Security Council Resolution 1373 and other relevant resolutions. In support of the Committee, CTAT continues to explore flexible and innovative ways to ensure business continuity in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. This includes our dialogue with the member states, our increased virtual engagement with the resident coordinators and country teams, our interaction with civil society and academia, and our production of analytical reports. And today's open briefing renewed, is a renewed um, testimony of our common commitment to combat terrorism and violent extremism while respecting human rights and the rule of law and ensuring a gender-sensitive approach. The committee's technical guide is an invaluable tool in this effort. It brings together on the one cover all the requirements stemming from the relevant Security Council resolutions, the guidance of the CTC and the many international norms and standards endorsed since the adoption of Security Council Resolution 1373 back in 2001. The present update is the third edition of the technical guide and it's intended to serve many. And foremost, it enables CTAT to conduct more accurate, in-depth and consistent assessments uh, that reflect the latest development uh, in the Security Council. Second, it enables member states to better prepare for CDC assessments as it provides background information, questions on key thematic issues and details of existing good practices, norms and standards. Third, it can be used by member states as self-review and an evaluation tool. Member states can easily refer to the questions and features contained in the guide to help them assess their own policies, strategies and approaches. Lastly, the updated guide will enable CTAT and its partners to ensure the technical assistance is delivered to states in a more targeted manner. The continually evolving nature of the service threats require member states to continually update their counterterrorism and violent extremist approaches. The technical guide will be of considerable assistance to states in their development of holistic, comprehensive, and multidisciplinary policies, strategies, and whole of society approaches that respect human rights and also take gender dynamics and sensitivities into consideration. The technical guide is not just a tool for member states, but also an invaluable source of practical guidance for practitioners in the field. I'd like to thank the members of the committee who oversaw and guided the development of this latest edition of the guide. I would especially like to thank all my colleagues uh, all my team at CDET were instrumental and who worked uh, really diligently to ensure the highest possible level of details and uh, accuracy. And lastly, I would really like to thank and express my gratitude to uh, all our colleagues from DGACM who worked tirelessly with my team to edit and translate into the six uh, official UN languages, making it accessible uh, on the CTC website, our uh, technical guide, and make it uh, accessible to all stakeholders around the world, including policymakers and practitioners. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank uh, ASG Konings for uh, her remarks and the uh, overview. Uh, we will first hear presentation from the Counter-Terrorism uh, Committee, 
executive directorate highlighting the different elements of the uh, updated technical guide. I first uh, invite uh, Mr. Uh, David Sharia, Chief of Branch, to present an overview of the updated technical guide. You have the floor. Thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you uh, to member states for their continued interest in the technical guide and their support to us in the development. As uh, ASG Konings already mentioned, uh, the CITED technical guide is the main methodological tool used by CITED in its assessment by relying on one assessment tool, one assessment methodological tool, CITED ensures that its assessments are consistent regardless of which state it assesses. I am hence very pleased to share with you key developments on the new technical guide. It was as was mentioned already, it is a product in which all seated experts participate and contributed. So allow me also to thank all my colleagues at seated for contributing many hours to refining this document and making it as robust and as accurate as it is. It integrates all Security Council resolutions, including the two latest, 2462 of 2019 and 2482, and include references to other relevant resolutions adopted between its previous version and now. The updated draft also incorporates the input and guidance of the committee members, including in particular the Madrid guiding principles and its addendum. Since the publication of the last technical guide, the Security Council has passed eight relevant Security Council resolutions and relevant guidance in the Madrid guiding principles. All of these tools and instruments are integrated in this version. The technical guide was brought for discussion before the CTC and was sent by the chair to the president of the Security Council, who had it circulated as a Security Council document and translated to all six official languages. We are glad to report to you that the translation process of this long and highly technical document, 145 pages, I just checked, is now available in all six official languages. I would like also to stress that the guide was prepared by CITED. Hence, it does not purport to impose any obligations upon states, apart from those that already exist by virtue of the relevant Security Council resolutions and decisions, international treaty, it treaties customary international law or other voluntary undertaken obligation. In the elaboration of this tool, much consideration was given to the mainstreaming of human rights and gender. In all areas of CITED engagements, these issues are covered. They are not boxed in any way, but cut across all areas of the, of the technical guide, from the hard measures of law enforcement and prosecutions, all the way to the soft measures such as CVE, counter narratives, and community engagement. My colleague, E.J. Flynn, will elaborate further on how this mainstream, mainstreaming process was conducted. How can member states use the technical guide? First and foremost, in preparing for the CTC country visits. But they can also use it in many other ways and was mentioned as was mentioned by ASG Konings. They can use it for self-assessment if they want to check that uh, all their resolutions are duly incorporated in their legislations in their in practical measures. Our partners can use it for designing technical assistance programs, making sure that technical assistance programs match the requirements of the Security Council. And policymakers and practitioners can use it in order to deep, deep, deep dive into the requirements of the resolutions and the long jurisprudence of the, C of the CTC and the Council. Actually, it is the most updated and most comprehensive tool on counterterrorism and Security Council resolutions requirement. Let me reassure you that we intend to keep it constantly updated. With your permission, I would like to highlight some of the developments while my colleagues who join me will add some on some specific areas. On border security and law enforcement, CITED has updated the technical guide with new requirements from resolution 2396. They include new language on API and PNR requirements, on the need to develop watch lists and good practices developed in this space, uh, on the need to develop and implement system to collect biometric data in order to responsibly and properly identify terrorists, including FTF. The updates acknowledge that effective implementation of these requirements 
require states to take many measures and require technical and operational capacity and expertise. Measures to protect human rights are critical in all the aforementioned areas and have been reflected in the updates as well. The updated technical guide also includes elements regarding protection of soft targets, especially in establishing partnerships with stakeholders and sharing of information and expertise to protect soft targets in accordance with Security Council Resolution 2396. In its Resolution 2370, the, the Council recognized the need for member states to take appropriate measures to address the illicit trafficking in small arms and light weapons. Building upon the elements of 2370, the technical guide has been updated, including also with elements of Resolution 2482, in which the Council, the council urged, among other things, states to adopt and implement measures to establish as criminal offense and with their domestic law in accordance under the domestic law of illegal manufacture, possession, stockpiling, and trades of all types of explosives. Particular attention in the technical guide is paid to the threat posed by the use of improv improvised explosive devices, or IED. This has been integrated in the technical guide and, as we know, is used in many terrorist attacks around the world. The Council Madrid guiding principles on stemming the flow of FTFs and the addendum have given us more guidance on, the, on how to prevent the use of small arms light weapons by terrorists, and they've both been integrated as well. In the area of information and communication technology, in Resolution 2396, the Council called on states to take measures to improve the collection, handling, preservation, and sharing of relevant information and evidence in accordance with the domestic and international law. The Council also encouraged Member States' cooperation with the private sector, especially with ICT service providers, in gathering digital data and evidence in cases relating to terrorism. In response to the terrorist increased use of ICT for terrorist purposes, the Madrid Guiding Principles recognized that Member States should build ICT and forensic capacities within criminal justice and national law enforcement agencies to monitor social media content related to terrorism as digital evidence for inter investigation and prosecution. These areas has also been covered by the updated the, the technical guide, and I encourage you to look on these specific areas of interest. In this respect, it is also important to recall that any infringement on the right of privacy must comply with the principles of necessity and proportionality, as well as non-discrimination. In addition, the guide recommends that ICT service providers Terms of service should target content aimed at recruitment for terrorism or inciting others to commit terrorist acts and publish regular transparency reports on the implementation of such terms in compliance with freedom of expression, taking into account, uh, taking into consideration the work of the industry-led Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism and the seated supported initiative Tech Against Terrorism. As per Resolution 2462, the technical guide also integrates the use of new technologies in the field of terrorism uh, uh, financing, and my colleague Angela Vincenzo will expand on this issue in her remarks. The updated guide reflects the continued effort towards strengthening the mainstreaming of gender in member states' implementation of their counterterrorism measures. Since 2017, several Security Council resolutions introduced a range of additional gender provisions in the areas of human trafficking and sexual violence, counter-narrative, and prosecution, rehabilitation, and reintegration. And regarding human trafficking and sexual violence, pursuant to Resolution 2388 and 2467, the technical guide has been updated to incorporate language on human trafficking and its significance in the financing of terrorism, as well as recognition that acts of trafficking in person and sexual and gender-based violence can be part of a strategic object objective and ideology of terrorist groups. The updates ensure that gender factors are considered when addressing the needs of victims of human trafficking and sexual violence perpetrated by terrorist groups, and that the victims of such crimes are recognized as victims of terrorism. The technical guides highlights the need for states to ensure that their domestic laws and regulation establish serious criminal offenses sufficient to provide the ability to prosecute and penalize in a manner duly reflecting the seriousness of the offense of trafficking in persons committed 
with the purpose of supporting terrorist organizations or individual terrorists, individual terrorists. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the technical guide is an incredible resource for member states and practitioners in the field of counterterrorism. As I mentioned, it can be used for self-assessment, it can be used by policymakers and practitioners, it can be used by our partners when designing technical assistance programs, and as I said already, it is the most updated and most comprehensive tool on Security Council counterterrorism re requirements. CTED maintains its commitment to regularly updating these practical tools, and we thank you for your time and attention. I look forward to answering any questions you may have in the Q&A session. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I give the floor back to you. I thank Mr. Sharia for his uh, briefing. Our next uh, presenters uh, will chair uh, some of the updates related to uh, countering the financing of uh, terrorism issues, to legal and criminal justice issues, and final to human rights issue. You will see uh, the topic of each presentation on uh, today's uh, agenda. I now give the floor to uh, Ms. Angela Vinasco, associate expert. You have the floor. Mr. Chairman, dear members of the Counterterrorism Committee, dear delegates of permanent missions, colleagues, it is now my turn to address the most recent updates of the technical guide with regards to the issue of countering the financing of terrorism, or CFT. My name is Angela Vinasco, and I am an associate expert and a JPO at CITED. I would like to start by highlighting that the new CFT elements incorporated in the technical guide concern two resolutions adopted last year. Resolution 2462, the first devoted to preventing and suppressing terrorism financing, and Resolution 2482, on the links between organized crime and terrorism. The seven key updates I would like to present today cover the following topics. The criminalizing of terrorism financing, asset freezing, terrorism financing risk assessments, public-private partnerships, financial intelligence, effect of CFT measures on exclusively humanitarian activities, and links with organized crime. With regards to criminalizing terrorism financing, several resolutions set forth by the Council require states to criminalize the financing of terrorism and to take a number of measures to prevent and suppress it starting with Resolution 1373. In addition, Resolution 2462 continues to strongly urge all states to implement the comprehensive international standards embodied in the Financial Action Task Force recommendations and highlights that the financing of terrorist organizations or individual terrorists shall be established as a criminal offense even if they are in the absence of a link to a terrorist act. Therefore, the updated technical guide contains new guidance material on the criminalizing of terrorism financing. As for freezing terrorist assets without delay and in order to enhance international cooperation and improve the effectiveness of asset freezing mechanisms, Resolution 2462 also encourages member states to make publicly available their national or regional asset freezing lists. In these regards, a new paragraph in the technical guide refers to the need for states to consider making asset freezing lists publicly available. Resolution 2462 also puts a new focus on terrorism financing risks. This focus has resulted in a new and dedicated subsection in the CFT chapter of the technical guide, mainly to ensure that due consideration is given to how countries assess specifically their terrorism financing risk and identify economic sectors most vulnerable to terrorism financing. Issues addressed in this section include whether a country has conducted a dedicated national risk assessment, whether these assessments are regularly updated, and whether significant sectors vulnerable to terrorist financing risks, such as the construction, commodities, or pharmaceutical sectors, have conducted sectorial risk assessments. The periodic risk assessment of the non-profit organization remains a key consideration in the technical guide, which continues to take note that countries need to protect non-profit organizations or NPOs from potential abuse 
in accordance with the risk-based approach and in respect of human rights and fundamental freedoms. Allow me to stress the importance that the assessment of NPOs be not only a one-off exercise, but an exercise to be updated periodically. With regards to financial intelligence, Resolution 2462 has highlighted the value of financial intelligence and the value of financial investigations in counterterrorism. This topic also constitutes a new subsection in the technical guide, which include new considerations on the need to reinforce the analytical capacity of the financial intelligence units, or FIUs, to strengthen frameworks that allow for interagency coordination in order to more effectively investigate the financing of terrorism, as well as to in intensify the timely exchange of information, financial intelligence, domestically and internationally, in terrorism-related cases. Now, as the private sector possesses a wealth of information that can assist authorities in establishing financial connections between subjects connected to terrorism, the Council has encouraged the establishment of partnerships with the private sector including financial institutions, the financial technology industry, and internet and social media companies. Hence, the updated version of the technical guide contains more guidance on the need for states to use uh, partnerships to disseminate terrorism financing risk indicators and to ensure that competent authorities can use relevant financial information obtained from the private sector. Moreover, it considers whether the authorities cooperate with the private sector, in particular with regard to the evolution of trends, SIRs, and methods of terrorism financing. Notably, OP24 of Resolution 2462 urges states, when designing and applying measures to counter the financing of terrorism, to take into account the potential effect of those measures on exclusively humanitarian activities including medical activities that are carried out by impartial humanitarian actors in a manner consistent with international humanitarian law. This consideration is also reflected in the technical guide under the section dedicated to NPOs. Here, a question has been added on how countries have taken into account the effects of their CFT measures in exclusively humanitarian activities. Lastly, a final element that I would like to bring forward today concerns the links between terrorism and organized crime. Resolution 2482 builds on previous Council resolutions by encouraging countries to increase their understanding of the nature and the scope of the links that may exist between terrorism and organized crime. Further consideration is now given to the extent to which countries conduct research and collect information, particularly associated with trafficking in persons, as my colleague David Sharia just pointed out, but also the illicit trafficking of natural resources, arms, drugs, artifacts, and cultural property. I hope this presentation has well reflected how the technical guide can be a valuable guidance tool on new issues related to CFT. Many thanks for your time, and I, of course, remain available to answer any questions you may have. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Merci, merci beaucoup. Uh, and uh, I now give the floor to uh, Mr. Anton Duplessis, Legal and Criminal Justice uh, Coordinator and Senior uh, Legal uh, Officer. You have the floor. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, colleagues, good morning. I'm the Legal and Criminal Justice Coordinator at CETED, and as this is my first CTC briefing since returning from special leave for family reasons, let me say how nice it is to see uh, previous members and colleagues, and of course, to meet new ones, albeit virtually. I'm going to provide a snapshot of the relevant legal and criminal justice elements of the new technical guide that's been touched upon by David earlier. And these stem largely from Resolution 2396, which reference to. I'll focus most of my remarks on the prosecution, rehabilitation, and reintegration, or PRR, developments, and also some new aspects of international cooperation. And we can pick up any additional questions or issues that we may have uh, later. Now, these resolutions, as we know, build on a platform that was initially laid by Resolution 1373 almost 20 years ago. Now, this seminal resolution imposed legal obligations on all states to bring terrorists to justice while respecting international law and human rights. Now, it's important to get this right from a legal and a strategic perspective. Indeed, 
human rights compliant counterterrorism responses or criminal justice responses can help to strengthen the social contract with communities and can be one of our greatest tools in the fight against terrorism. I think recent PRR developments are key in this regard, as are the new forms of international cooperation in criminal matters, especially when related to military evidence, which I'll touch on in a moment. But let me start by highlighting the relevant elements of Resolution 2396, in particular those relating to PRR. Now, as you all know, there are currently thousands of FTFs or people associated with terrorist groups that are in prison or administrative detention facilities across the world. And over 10,000 ISIL members and their families are in detention camps in Syria and Iraq. Now, this is a crisis situation that poses a range of risks and humanitarian challenges. Now, the reality is that in some cases, the use of rigid prosecution policies and practices could be counterproductive. Now, Resolution 2396 builds on previous resolutions and requires a case-by-case -case approach to implement comprehensive, coherent, and tailored PRR strategies and engagements. Let me just highlight a few additions to the technical guide, um, some recommendations. The first is that member states in this regard need clear and coordinated legal and policy frameworks related to comprehensive and tailored PRR strategies that have a solid foundation in the rule of law and human rights. This matters from a legal perspective, but it's also a vital part of our broader effort to prevent violent extremism. As we all know too well, inappropriate counterterrorism responses can fuel the very fire that we are trying to douse. Our member states also need evidence-based comprehensive risk assessment tools to assess the, and categorize people associated with terrorist groups. It's often challenging to determine the extent to which individuals have committed um, terrorist-related offenses and the specific role they may have played. In this regard, a clear assessment methodology will ensure objective, effective, and tailored responses to each individual, taking into consideration, of course, gender and age sensitivities, which I'll come to in a moment. Now, member states should also develop coordination mechanisms among relevant stakeholders as part of the whole of government and whole of society approach. Effective PRR requires a multitude of stakeholders, including from civil society, as appropriate. Now, the, tech the technical guide also includes a number of key gender updates and recommendations related to PRR. This is a priority issue considering the large number of women and children, um, both foreign and local, that are remaining in camps in, south, in northeastern Syria under untenable conditions. Now, significant challenges also exist in relation to other groups in other regions, for example, Boko Haram in the Lake Chad Basin and Al-Shabaab in Somalia. So relevant updates in the guide include the following. The need to recognize the very many different roles, including as supporters, facilitators, and perpetrators of terrorist acts that women play, which requires special focus when developing ta tailored PRR strategies. These stress the importance of assisting women and children associated with FTFs who may have been victims of terrorism and who do, and to do so take into account gender and age sensitivities. Secondly, it encourages the participation of leadership of women in the design, the implementation, and the monitoring and evaluation of strategies for returning and relocating FTFs and their families. The guide encourages member states to develop gender-sensitive counter-narrative strategies, particularly in the prison setting and prison system. And finally, in cases involving children, their treatment must be determined with the best interests of the child as the primary consideration. And this is a really key part of the updates which we've made. But finally, let me briefly touch also on one new challenging aspect of international cooperation in criminal matters that was further expanded in Resolution 2396. And here I'm referring to the challenge of collecting and sharing evidence in high-risk situations. With FTFs, the evidence often remains in places where civilian practitioners cannot conduct investigations on site. However, the military, for example, can facilitate the collection of information as they may be the only actors on the ground at that time. In such cases, a particular challenge is ensuring that the retrieved information meets the legal threshold to be admissible as evidence in criminal procedure, proceedings. This challenge lies at the heart of the broader approach to effective PRR responses by member states. Now, the updated technical guide includes the following um, in this regard. The need for states to facilitate the collection, sharing, and admissibility of evidence, um, of information and evidence related to terrorism and FTF cases by the military, while of course preserving the chain of custody and respecting the integrity of the criminal proceedings, and of course in compliance with international human rights and international humanitarian law, Second, the importance of criminal justice officials establishing early and timely working relationships with relevant legally minded uh, mandated actors in conflict zones that can assist in the collecting of information that can be submitted to evidence. And to assist states in this regard, 
you'll be aware that CETA had worked with relevant UN partners, including UNODC and UNOCT, to develop guidelines that cover the key legal and practical challenges in this regard. These military evidence guidelines, as we've uh, the shorthand for them, have been translated into French, and UNODC is now using them as part of a broader capacity building program for requesting member states. And let me conclude. The technical guide will continue, as David said, to be a living document that will be updated regularly to reflect the new developments relating to our mandate. But as the nature and complexity of terrorism evolves, so too must our responses. And one area that we haven't touched on in detail uh, today or in the um, discussion uh, is that I believe will require additional info, uh, attention in the coming months is the interrelationship between counterterrorism measures and international humanitarian law, taking into account the recent resolutions that Angela referred to, 2462 and 2482. IRC TED looks forward to supporting the work of the committee in this regard within our mandate and expertise, and we welcome your guidance as we engage more substantively on this issue moving forward. Thank you very much, Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. <laughs> I thank Mr. De Duplessis for his presentation, and now I give the floor to Mr. Edward Flynn, Human Rights Coordinator and Senior Legal Officer. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, indeed, the, the updated technical guide addresses relevant human rights issues throughout the text. It reflects the fact that the Security Council and the Counterterrorism Committee have both stressed on numerous occasions that respect for human rights and the rule of law in counterterrorism efforts is essential to their success and that failure in this regard could lead to further radicalization to terrorism. Human rights are thus mainstreamed throughout the document. And this makes sense because measures taken by states around the world against terrorism and violent extremism continue, unfortunately, to raise serious human rights questions. In some cases, counterterrorism measures involve the introduction of special or even exceptional measures that threaten human rights compliance. United Nations human rights mechanisms are raising concerns even now that far from seeing a reduction in apparent violations, it appears that counterterrorism measures are leading to an increased number of human rights violations in countries around the world. So CTAD, under the guidance of the committee, is continuing to pay close attention to this crucial aspect of counterterrorism. The revised technical guide addresses in detail several new and challenging areas of counterterrorism that have become central to our work as a result of recent resolutions, including Resolution 2396 on returning foreign terrorist fighters. But I should stress at the outset that the core human rights issues contained in the guide that were of relevance to our early founding resolutions have not changed. These include, for example, the critical issue of respect for the principle of legality in the criminalization of terrorism offenses. Criminalization, of course, is a fundamental requirement of Resolution 1373. However, it remains unfortunately relevant to consider whether states have adopted laws that are precisely drafted, or if they are, on the other hand, vague or overbroad, allowing for criminal enforcement measures to be used against acts that are protected under international human rights law, including acts of political protest or dissent. The guide also takes note of the fact that states may, as I mentioned earlier, adopt special or even exceptional procedures for use in terrorism arrests and prosecutions, such as extended periods of investigative detention or limited access by accused persons to information or evidence that is said to be classified. The guide notes that such special provisions must be set out in law and be strictly guided by necessity and proportionality, including time limits, if appropriate, and must ensure non-discrimination in order to protect the human rights of detainees or defendants. These concerns have not changed substantially since the original publication of the technical guide. But the revised guide also tackles new human rights issues that have become central to effective counterterrorism in our time. Let me mention just a few of them. 
Uh, one relates to the use of information and communications technologies in counterterrorism, and in particular, the related question of data gathering and preservation. The gathering and dissemination of data for purposes of, for example, border control or for international legal cooperation have become common in counterterrorism. The technical guide notes the risks that such measures may pose to respect for the right to privacy as well as to other human rights, such as the presumption of innocence. It sets out guidance for the handling of such data, noting, for example, that any international transfer of information for investigation purposes should be essential to the objective of an investigation, and requests for it should be written in such a way so as to prevent the disclosure of data that is not strictly relevant or necessary. The guide also considers the use of biometrics and watch lists, both of which are innovative requirements of Resolution 2396. Concerning biometrics, the guide stresses the principle of, quote, responsible use. It urges states to adopt clear human rights-based frameworks for the use of biometric technology with procedural safeguards and effective oversight and the provision of effective remedies in case of violations supplemented by review process processes that help guide national poli policymaking in this sensitive area. The responsible protection and storage of biometric data remains essential. As for watch lists, the guide also emphasizes effective oversight, paying particular attention to data management and to the purposes for which the data are to be used. It also calls for clear and appropriate criteria including with respect to how terrorism is defined, to ensure that the inclusion of persons' names in terrorism watch lists and databases is appropriate. I'd also like to call attention to the guide's discussion of the treatment of persons convicted of terrorism-related offenses being held in prison, which is another key element of Security Council Resolution 2396. The guide stresses that all efforts to address the risks of terrorist radicalization and recruitment in prisons and to rehabilitate and reintegrate prisoners into society must ensure full respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms, and that they should include a gender perspective and take into consideration the rights of children as necessary. The guide also stresses the need to ensure that conditions of detention respect the dignity of all prisoners including protection from torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment, and that they provide for adequate material conditions and personal safety. Finally, I would like to highlight the guide's attention to the issues of countering incitement to terrorism as per Resolution 1624, countering violent extremism, and countering terrorist narratives. On these critical preventive measures taken by states, the guide reiterates that states have the obligation, first, to prohibit incitement within a rule of law framework that takes account of preserving the rights to freedom of conscience and freedom of expression. But it also considers innovative approaches that states could take in accordance with Security Council resolutions to implement whole of society strategies to counter violent extremism that are based on partnerships with non-governmental actors such as civil society organizations, women's groups, religious leaders, the private sector, and youth. It refers to the need to effectively counter the narratives promoted by groups, including ISIL, Al-Qaeda, and others, aimed at inciting and recruiting others to commit terrorist acts, as called for by Resolution 2354. It recommends that states should engage in all these activities while also safeguarding the rights to freedom of expression and association, maintaining the independence of civil society and human rights defenders, and ensuring the right to personal security in accordance with their obligations under international law. The guide suggests that states should consider engaging in voluntary cooperation with the private sector and civil society to develop more effective means to counter the use of the internet for terrorist purposes. It suggests that states may wish to ensure that all actors expected to play a role in counter-narrative and CVE efforts have the necessary financial resources, training, and guidance to do this sensitive work effectively and in a human rights-compliant and gender and age-sensitive manner. 
There are, of course, many other human rights provisions in the technical guide, but I will stop here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank Mr. Flynn for his uh, presentation, which uh, brings us to the end of uh, seated uh, presentation. We will uh, now open the floor to any uh, questions or comment. We have uh, about uh, one hour. Uh, so I would ask you to kindly keep your intervention uh, concise. In the first round, I will give the floor to uh, members uh, of the uh, Counterterrorism Committee. Uh, does any member of the committee wish to take uh, the floor? If so, I would ask you to indicate in uh, the chat uh, function. I would ask the secretary to help me identifying those who are wishing to take uh, the floor from uh, the committee the member states. Uh, Ambassador, at this moment, I don't have anyone in the chat. If I could just reiterate your call for anybody uh, to so indicate, uh, just give me one moment. Uh, the United Kingdom. Thank All you, right. Chair. Uh, Thank you, you have thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to everyone um, who's attending. It was really great to hear from CTED about all these changes because we know how important the technical guide is as a tool for states that are receiving CTED visits or planning for an assessment visit. Um, so to that end, I just had a, a technical question for the technical guide. Um, <coughs> And that is, when will this guide be made available to states? Um, will it be on the website and will it be proactively sent out to states that are anticipating a visit, um, whether real um, or virtual, within the next year? Thank you. Thank you, UK, for your question. Uh, I give the floor back to the briefers to respond uh, to this uh, question. Thank you, uh, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the UK for these uh, two questions. The answer is um, uh, affirmative to both. I believe the technical guide is either already on the website or should be there any day, uh, if not. Um, um, and as to um, uh, sharing it with member states who are about to be visited, uh, the answer is also positive here. We actually even started sharing it only in its v English version as soon as the CTC uh, reviewed it. And um, so um, we, now we can share it in all official languages. So the member states concerned can share it with officials in capitals who, who don't necessarily speak English. Uh, but I believe beginning um, last um, June or July, um, um, no, probably few few weeks earlier, we started sharing it uh, with uh, with uh, with all member states who are about to be visited or will have any uh, meaningful dialogue with uh, CTED. Thank you. Thank you very much. If there is no uh, other committee member uh, have further comment, I will now uh, open uh, the floor to all participants. When taking the floor, I would be grateful if you please uh, use the chat function to express uh, your wish to take the floor by identifying uh, your delegation. I shall recall that all participants should mute their uh, microphone when they are not uh, taking the floor. I recognize uh, Omar Kadiri, the representative from Morocco. 
Omar, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you for organizing this extremely important open briefing on the technical guide to the implementation of Security Council Resolution 1373 and other relevant resolutions and for inviting us to participate. Allow me first of all to express to you, Mr. Chair, our highest appreciation for the excellent work you and your delegation are doing as chair of the CTC, as well as non-permanent member of the Security Council. You can count on Morocco's full support, Mr. Ambassador. I would like to also express our utmost appreciation to CTED Executive Director, Ms. Michelle Koenigs and her team, and ensure them of Morocco's continued support and cooperation. Uh, I thank all the briefers, of course, for their presentations. Morocco is grateful to the CTC and CTED for their continued commitment and for pursuing their pivotal activities, especially during the last months marked by the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak. The sustained efforts of the CTC and CTED are of particular importance in the current context, given the impacts of this pandemic on terrorist activities and member states' responses. As highlighted in the recent CTED paper on the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on terrorism, counterterrorism, and countering violent extremism. Unfortunately, terrorism remains one of the most significant threats to international peace, security, and stability, as well as to the full enjoyment of human rights and social and economic development. Trends and dynamics related to terrorism call for a co comprehensive and integrated approach, as well as the implementation of the effective measures to prevent and combat this threat in all its forms and manifestations. These measures must be in line with the United Nations Global Counterterrorism Strategy and relevant Security Council resolutions, as the UN remains the only internationally agreed guidance on the fight against terrorism and related threats. Morocco fully subscribes to the aforementioned resolutions and reaffirms its commitment to continue aligning its counterterrorism actions with the United Nations framework. The Kingdom of Morocco welcomes CTED's efforts to support and guide member states in the implementation of their obligations under the provisions of relevant Security Council resolutions, in particular, Resolution 1373. The present technical guide is an important tool available to member states to assist them with the identification of areas requiring technical assistance to strengthen the responses and compliance with international requirements. It also guides the development of appropriate responses and mobilization of the necessary expertise and resources to address needs and gaps in central areas, such as countering terrorism financing, border security and management, and the role of women and civil society in preventing and combating terrorism. Morocco remains committed to continue undertaking the necessary actions and initiatives to ensure the optimal implementation of the relevant counterterrorism obligations, as well as CTEDs recommendations following its last year's follow-up visit to Morocco on behalf of the CTC. I would like to seize this opportunity to express Morocco's thanks and appreciation for the said follow-up visit conducted from 26 to 28 June 2019. This third visit was an excellent opportunity to take stock of the progress made by Morocco in the implementation of the relevant Security Council resolutions on counterterrorism to identify the good practice developed by the Kingdom in this field as well as, as its technical assistance needs. Morocco remains committed to continue cooperating constructively with CTED and reinforcing the established regular and positive interaction. Finally, Mr. Chair, Morocco also stands ready to work together with all relevant stakeholders to identify ways to increase capacity building collaboration in countering terrorism and preventing violent extremism through sharing Morocco's experience, expertise and good practices including those identified by CTED during the follow-up visit. I thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and you can continue to count on our full support and cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I thank the representative of, uh, of uh, Morocco, and I thank Morocco for its commitment to counterterrorism. And now give the floor to representative uh, Cuba. Cuba, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you so much to all panelists. Uh, we would like to thank you for convening this important briefing and on, this, in, on that issue that is very important for all member states. We want to take this opportunity to underline that Cuba, which has been victim of terrorist acts, reiterate its profound rejection and condemnation of all terrorist acts, methods, and practices 
in all its form and manifestation, whatever their motivation. Our country strictly comply with obligation on the relevant resolution of the Security Council. We consider the guide is comprehensive and includes a lot of issues that can help member states to implement the relevant Security Council resolution on terrorist issues. While we recognize the relevance of those issues, we consider that the guide includes some human rights provisions that can duplicate procedures of other UN bodies and also that uh, uh, places an additional burden on member states. However, we support your work and your effort in this regard. We really appreciate to know how does the guy address or could address the commission of acts of state terrorism of which many countries, including Cuba, have been victims. Also, we would like to know more details about the mechanisms that the CTC and CTED have in place to assist member states to develop the guides at the national level. We would like to reiterate our full support to your work and the work of the CTC and the CTED. Thank you so much. I thank the representative of uh, Cuba and uh, I give uh, back the floor to the briefers to respond to this uh, question. On the issues, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and on, on the issue of um, states' uh, responsibilities regarding terrorist acts, the guide follows uh, accurately and precisely the language of uh, Resolution 1373, uh, the mother of all uh, Security Council counterterrorism resolutions, which requires state, all states to prevent uh, terrorists from using their, soil, uh, their territory as safe havens. That's the language uh, of the resolution, and the technical guide um, incorporates what are the specific uh, requirements uh, that the CTC and the Council have adopted to incorporate uh, these uh, requirements in domestic uh, legislation. Uh, I do not wish to be too technical uh, about uh, in this uh, in this presentation, but I uh, would invite the, my colleague from. Uh, from Cuba to have a look at the specific provisions relating to denying safe haven, which is a key element of a resolution 1373 and has a long list of specific questions that capture this element. Um, I'm not sure I've captured the second question. If, uh, if uh, you don't mind, uh, Mr. Chair, giving back the floor to Cuba to, uh, um, to, to explain the second question uh, regarding uh, national implementation. Thank you. Yeah, Cuba, you have the floor again, please. Thank you so much for, for your answer. Uh, also, we would like to know or at least take, uh, get more details about the mechanisms that the CDC and CTED have in place to assist member states to develop the guides at the national level with uh, what are the, the mechanisms the, for member states in order to support and to assist member states uh, to implement uh, this uh, guide. Thank you. Um, yeah, Mr. David, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, so, um, the, the first thing that we have is, uh, is is the guide itself, of course, which uh, in a way is uh, it speaks for itself. It's, it was mentioned by ASG Connings earlier that it is user friendly, and it describe it, it's structured in a series as a series of questions. Hence, every member state uh, can take it, uh, download it, and I've just been told that it's already available on our website. Download, share it with policy with policymakers and practitioners in their government and just do self-assessment by checking uh, those questions and the answers that uh, um, the government officials can give. Do we have this piece of legislation in place? Do we have this practical measure in place? By doing this, member states can actually self-assess their, their capacity without even seated a country visit. Beyond that, of course, when uh, throughout dialogue with member states, we uh, 
bring to their attention the, 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 the technical guide. My colleagues and I are always happy to get questions from member states on what specific provisions uh, actually uh, entail. I also mentioned, and I'm happy to reiterate that, that we would like to see that technical guide also as a tool for capacity building. CTED, as you know, is not implementing any technical assistance uh, programs, but our partners do. And when we liaise with them on specific initiatives, we refer them to the technical guide and we encourage them to make sure that their programs in the design phase match the requirements of the council so they can easily check box and make sure that whatever program they design for every member state actually captures the needs and the requirements of uh, the council. Thank you. I thank you very much. I do not see a further request for uh, for the floor. I uh, yes, Salvador is asking for the floor. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, we would also like uh, Salvador would like to thank the valuable work of the CTC in this briefing, from which we consider it gathers an important guidance on the multiple factors that have been updated on the technical guide but particularly the different national realities that we must consider when each country faces uh, their own policies to deal with terrorism. Uh, as you might know, with reference to El Salvador, our national reality has led to adopting the special law against terrorist acts, which recognizes particularly gangs uh, among any other criminal organizations as terrorist groups. Um, the gang phenomenon was neglected or wrongly addressed uh, during different government administrations, but over time, gangs became organized structures with diversified operations, such as extortion, territorial control, and monitoring local drug markets. So the government of President Nayib Bukele has prioritized the territorial control plan, which affirms a comprehensive response to protect our population from such terrorist groups and to rebuild the vulnerable local social fabric and the recovery of territories and public spaces and the empowerment of youth. We appreciate also that the technical guide also reflects a specific uh, interrelationship with um, methods of suppression on financing any act of terrorism. For us, that is very important, especially uh, also to take into account the need to strengthen institutional framework. We have recently, our government uh, has recently created anti-corruption investigation subdirectorates within the national police in order to detect cases of money laundering and financing of terrorist structures. Well, certainly, Mr. Chair and um, the CTC, we, El Salvador, consider this technical guide will be very useful for future actions, and we remain attentive to any further updates uh, on the implementation of such guides. So thank you very much. I thank very much the representative of El Salvador for her uh, comments. I don't see uh, further requests for the, the, the floor. I thank all uh, participants for your comments, questions, and insights regarding the updated technical uh, guide. I now give the floor to uh, the Assistant Secretary General for her uh, closing remarks. Madam, you have the floor. Thanks a lot, sir, Mr. Chair. Uh, excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all uh, for uh, your uh, uh, joining us, uh, all uh, the members of the, the committee, member states uh, and counterterrorism practitioners joining us uh, and also um, showing active interest uh, and uh, participating. We all know and um, very fully that uh, terrorism and violent extremism are constant and evolving uh, threats and we recognize that we must remain vigilant, agile, uh, alert and proactive in our approaches and um, responses. I believe that uh, the updated technical guide will be an invaluable tool for all of us in our efforts to do so. It will be uh, of considerable assistance 
member states and counterterrorism practitioners in their efforts uh, not only to identify and address uh, short-term uh, challenges, but also to plan medium and long-term approaches in accordance with relevant Security Council resolutions. It will also help ensure member states uh, um, place human rights uh, and gender-sensitive approaches at the heart of all terrorism and CVE efforts. Allow me to thank you again. Um, I'm looking forward to, to our continued constructive dialogue and strong partnership. Please feel free to contact us all at CETA should you wish to have more um, uh, knowledge or know more about the updated uh, technical guides uh, or about specific areas of concern in relation to the implementation of the relevant Security Council resolutions. CETA remains committed to supporting all member states in their counterterrorism and CVE efforts whether through the development of tools such as the technical uh, guide, uh, country assessments, the facilitation of delivery of technical assistance, the promotion of international standards, codes and effective practices, Security Council and CTC policy papers, or the development and publication of analytical products. Um, we will all continue to relent at DC work now and in the future. Uh, you can really count on us. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Konix. Uh, Excellency, ladies and uh, gentlemen, I wish to thank you all for participating in today's uh, virtual uh, open briefing, which has uh, given us all an opportunity to learn about the uh, updates uh, made to the uh, technical guide by CTED with the guidance of the committee in response to the evolving uh, uh, terrorist landscape and in accordance with, uh, with uh, the recently adopted uh, resolution of the Security Council on uh, counterterrorism. The uh, open briefing has also given us uh, further opportunity to consider ongoing and emerging challenges, including in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, and to explore ways in which we might strengthen our counter-terrorism approach and measures. I encourage member states to use the technical guide on an ongoing basis and self-review and reference tool for the benefit of effective implementation of Security Council resolution. I believe that uh, the guide offers uh, vital support for member states seeking ways to further develop and improve their uh, counterterrorism policies, strategies, and uh, practices in, co in accordance with the relevant uh, Council resolution, uh, the 19th International Counterterrorism Instruments, and the relevant international norms, standards, and uh, best uh, practices. We must continue to adapt our approach to address uh, constantly evolving threats, uh, terrorist threats, as well as uh, the related uh, trends issue and, uh, and uh, challenges. Uh, the committee, with the support of CTED, will continue uh, its efforts uh, to ensure that the technical guide will uh, reflect any future new requirement of Security Council resolution and to ensure that uh, uh, ensure that uh, member states have access to the relevant information in all six uh, official UN languages. The committee remains determined to support member states and the other key uh, stakeholders in their effort to counter terrorism and violent extremism in accordance with the relevant Council resolution. Uh, I would like also to uh, thank the VTC technician and uh, the secretary for their uh, assistance. Uh, today's open briefing uh, is uh, adjourned. I thank you all.